and welcome to another episode of Voices of the Nation podcast. My name is Belle and today we have an extraordinary episode. Now today we will delve into the ways we can unite and collaborate within Singapore's creative industry to cultivate a dynamic, inclusive and sustainable environment. Now today we are very, very honoured to have a special guest with us. Now he is a multi-talented artist, renowned as a songwriter, singer, film director, but he liked to be known as a composer. Okay, without further ado, let's welcome our local artist, Dick Lee. Hello. Hello. Nice Hi, to Belle. meet you. Hi, nice to Take see you. Take a seat. Thank you. Hi, Dick. It's really so nice to have you with us this <laughs> afternoon. It's a pleasure. And Hello. as all of you <laughs> can see, my outfit, right, is really inspired by you. Oh, thank you very because much. Because we all know that you like bright colours. <laughs> yes. And it's the first time our friends around here have seen me wearing so bright for the first time. So it before, suits you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this is your favourite colour, right? Yes. I heard. Hot pink. <laughs> okay, so before we begin, let's introduce yourself to our viewers. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dick Lee. I like to think of myself as a composer. And I'm very happy you're here in my home. Yes. I like to uh, say happy National, national day, day in advance to everybody who's yes, watching. Yes, yes, yes. Now talking about <laughs> National Day, right? We talk about National Day parades. We look forward to our NDPs every year. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, we will associate the NDP with you because you wrote the song at home as well as you were the creative director for the National Day parade before. So could you share with us more about your experiences, um, be it uh, writing the song of home and being the creative director of the parade. Okay, um, well, let me set one thing straight first, is that uh, Home wasn't written for National Day. It was written for, um, actually, a campaign called Sing Singapore. Oh, it was and, for Yeah, and it was like a song competition. I was invited to submit. Back then, where were you? Were you in I Sing was in Hong Kong. I was living in Hong Kong and working there. And so, I was homesick, and I wrote Home, and submitted it, and I think that's why home has that element of yes, yeah, it's, a it's like sort of the bittersweet, of home yeah, that homesickness came through, and it won the competition, mm -hmm. and it was then uh, included in National Day Parade, nineteen ninety eight. I 1998. wrote the song in 97, 1997. Mm -hmm. So in nineteen ninety eight, it was included in National Day, but it wasn't the theme song of the National Day Parade. There were wow. no theme songs during that time. Wow, it lived yeah. until today. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I thought, I thought 25 it was a, years already. Yeah, and I thought it, it already was like a theme song for National Day Parade. Never, it's never like been. That. So the funny thing was that um, National Day Parades up to that time were mm -hmm. done by committees. Mm -hmm. And these committees consisted of uh, sort of the creative directors of the performing groups. Were they local? Yeah, like P uh, PA. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. You know, uh, groups like that. And then Ministry of Education, you know, with all the kids. They, they, so all these groups Come together. had one person and then they all sat together and then they decided on the National Day Parade, the show part. Mm -hmm. So in 2001, I got a call uh, and I was invited to be a creative director and I thought, wow, that's a great opportunity. I had just moved back from Hong Kong where I was living. And um, yeah, I, I, um, I was happy to accept it and it was such a huge project. It was in the National Stadium and I used to do events. Mm, oh, I Bef see. Yeah, so before had, like, I yeah, was a musician, I had an event company and I did fashion shows and launches. So I was used to doing shows events. and so this was the biggest show of my career so far. And um, yeah, so I did the National Day of 2002 and for that, NDP, mm -hmm. I wrote my first theme song, which is We Will Get There, Stung by Stephanie. Stephanie, yeah. I love that song. So that's actually my first NDP song. Mm -hmm. And then since then, I've done another four NDPs. Another four as a creative director? Yeah, yeah. Now for the first time when you were the creative director, were, were there mixed feelings or was it just pure excitement? From who? <laughs> from me um, and the audience? I guess from you, um, when you first received the invitation. It is a huge, huge task, you know. It's not like a fashion show, you know. So, uh, it was very stressful. So much so that halfway through the process, I got sick. I was really ill that year. Um, but I recovered in time to do the show. But, you know, it's, it's quite a, it was quite a stressful uh, a thing. And the first time for me, mm -hmm. first time for the NDP committee having 
um, a, a, a creative director, you know, like telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the highlights of that show was that, you know, as you rehearse, you have to fix things. And then yes. we realised that there was a gap. Uh, oh, suddenly, I think they had to put in a speech by Go Chok Tong or something uh -huh. like that. And so we had to add an item and I ended up being in the show. And there was a moment where I'm, I'm riding on a balloon okay. with okay. one of the performers and going around the stadium. And that was, that was a highlight because I'm raised. I'm yeah, raised higher right. than, the, than the stadium. It's an experience not a lot of people can get. Yeah, and of course the balloon is being carried by people. And I went around and when the fireworks ca mm. came up, it was like my eye level. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's like Cat 1, I got yeah. Cat 0 <laughs> that was at a, a concert. That was the best. <laughs> yeah. Wow, so that was some, there were some challenges as well and, and mm -hmm. I think it's a very memorable experience for you. And I remember that was actually during the, uh, we were still in the old stadium, right? The old stadium. Yeah, the old stadium. And then, um, so I was the first uh, independent creative director and mm -hmm. then from the years that followed, there, there, there's always been a creative director. Oh, and the theme songs uh, started, I think, in two, uh, 2000 maybe, 1998 and then 99 maybe they, they started to introduce yes. every year one song. And I've been looking forward to the National Day theme song every, every year, year. Yeah. and yeah. I really love some of them, like the, the older ones especially. Of course the newer ones are pretty good as well. Now uh, we, we talked about you being uh, no, you not, not only the creative director of National Day Parade, mm -hmm. you have done fashion shows, events, you're a composer. Now I know how I should address you. Eh? Yes. <laughs> and songwriter, singer, mm -hmm. and even a film director. Yes, how do Once, you, one, one movie. How do you alternate amongst all these roles? Um, you know, when you're young and you're, you're very full of energy and you want to do everything and you have all these ideas, um, I learned one, one thing in my life which I like to share with young people and, and that is patience. You know, you have your dreams, go ahead, mm -hmm. but be patient. Don't try and make them all happen at once. Like, it really doesn't happen within one or two years, but actually ten years. If it's not ready to happen, it won't happen. Then don't force it because you'll ruin it. And so, yeah, I, I, I had ideas of maybe doing a movie when I was, you know, 20 years ago, but then the time wasn't right and who wants to get oh, me to do a movie okay, yeah. but eventually I did and I waited you know I mean so I did all those things but not all at the same time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there was a time there's a time, time for everything was different, yeah different roles. and just you just have to wait and meanwhile while you're waiting you're growing oh that's true you're growing you're learning and by the time the Something opportunity comes you are ready correct you are, you know so much more so I, I think agree. that's important don't rush so here, here's another question, I'm quite curious. Which role was the challenging one for you, or the most challenging? Um, I would say um, when I did the Mad China Man album in 1989, and that was a breakthrough album for me because um, it introduced me to Asia, to Japan particularly. Uh -huh. And then the album came out in August of 89, 1989, August. By December, it had gone platinum, and that's wow. something very, very rare for an English local album. Yes, and we're talking about 34 years ago. Yes, and so to, not only to go platinum, it got attention outside of Singapore. Of Singapore. And long story short, I got invited uh, to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, at that time, like Japan is like so far Correct. away, and, and, and J-pop was a big thing. Yeah. It's like now, imagine if now I get invited to go to pop. Korea. <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit like that. And, and I didn't believe it at first. I couldn't, I, I, would, I was thinking like, why, why do they want me? What, what, what do they want from me? You know, like, leave me alone. In fact, <laughs> the first few offers I received, I actually rejected. I just ignored, oh, so not rejected. so you offered not only once, but a couple of times. By a producer who kept calling me. So eventually I met, and then not only did he offer to produce me, Mm -hmm. um, I got an offer to do a concert, a concert tour in Japan. Wow. Yeah, a, a multi-city concert tour in Japan in March the following year. Okay? And I had a manager, a, a lady came and wanted to be my manager. I didn't even have a mananager after that what? point. It, it just yeah. didn't feel like it dropped from the sky. Yeah, and, and I wasn't really looking for it. 
Uh, By that yeah. time, I was 33 years old. I was so old already. Like, who wants, why, who wants to start a <laughs> career at that age, right? And I thought, no, and I had a successful event company. Mm -hmm. Why should I leave that behind? Oh, right? that's true. So um, I wasn't sure about it, and especially not doing, not to do a con moving to Japan. I had to move because Warner Records wanted to sign me in Japan. Mm. Well, I was signed to Warner here. Like, you know, all of these <laughs> things are too drastic, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I thought, no, maybe I, I should just... And so, I think at a point of time, um, everything was quite... Uh, we were quite scared of actually exploring in other countries as well. Yeah, especially at something like this is so out of the blue and yes. it's not really something I really wanted. I was quite happy with my event company. It was doing well. Mm -hmm. So, um, one hard thing was to um, decide to go. So I decided, actually, at the end of December that year, I said, okay, I'm just going to go and try. And I took a leap of faith, you know, and I went. The other thing that was very stressful and daunting was do a con uh, to do a concert tour with a band, which I had never done yeah, before. and you probably so can't <laughs> communicate with them as well. No, a local band. Oh, I brought a band. Yeah? I was asked to bring my band from Singapore. I didn't even have a band. I had not had that kind of um, a life as an entertainer mm. up to that point. But I had eight albums out, okay? And I had performed in small clubs and all that, mm -hmm. in gigs. Yep. I played at university, you know, I played at schools, you know, like that. But to do a tour of Japan... It's a first. And it was sold out, like, within the day. And I thought, why? Why, why are they buying my... I didn't even understand. <laughs> How they even knew about me, you know? But somehow it all happened at, at the same time and I had to get this band together and I had to rehearse mm -hmm. and dance and sing yeah. in front of, you know, audience and all that was scary. Eventually, <laughs> did you know, um, did you eventually know why they know of you? Yes, because um, when my album came out, there was a guy who was a journalist mm -hmm. from the Japanese newspaper. Mm -hmm. And he had been following my career all through the 80s. He's a fan. Not he's a fan, he's a journalist. So he's a music specialist. Flesh and man. he had all my albums he collected. So when The Mad Chinaman came out, which was my eighth album, mm -hmm. he, he knew of me. He loved it so much, he went to promote it in Japan, Japan. himself. Oh. He made bootleg copies and he went to send it all over and got a lot of interest from all the music reviewers. And that's how that producer got to hear of me and ah. came to look for me. And I offer you the yeah. opportunity. Yeah, and so through that, then the album got released mm. in Japan under Warner, and they did a big marketing thing. I had, I remember, the first uh, ma uh, promotional uh, trip I made. It was like th two over weeks, daily, Practices. twenty thirty interviews a day. Wow! Because their media all was that's so a lot. interested. That's yeah. A lot. Wow, see, pr oh, this, uh, patience is very important. Yeah, you didn't yeah, have yeah. this opportunity the first time you, you release an album, but actually the eighth album. Well, and one. when you're 33 years old, you know, <laughs> like having to change a career at that, that point at is point very time, scary, you know. It is. Yeah, and I had friends who, who laughed at me, who said, are you sure, are you kidding? You want to be an, uh, like a pop singer at your age? Forget it. Because, you know, uh, singers were like 21, right? That's right. That's New right. artists, you know, some more. <laughs> but I think what was uh, the thing that made it for me was that I did have eight albums. Mm -hmm. and that gave me some experience, some credibility. I'm not brand new. Mm. That was one thing. The other thing that I had going for me was um, the times. Asia, it was a point when Asia was getting important. The late, the end of the 20th century. And um, Asian culture was starting to have some kind of prominence mm -hmm. and interest, mm -hmm. and especially in Japan. They That's had right. spent all the years after the war looking westwards, to, to the west, I mean. Yeah. But suddenly, you know, they had an the interest in Asia of, and, and Jap Japan being part of Asia started. And right until I appeared, the only other Asian artist that was big was Teresa Teng. You know who that right, is? Right, yeah. uh, from, from Taiwan. And she was big in Japan, but then she had passed away, right? Mm, yeah. And there was nothing. The Japanese knew nothing about, about Asia. The Chinese Asia. Or Asia. Oh. Indonesia, anywhere, mm -hmm. you know. Um, even Korea, K-pop was yeah, not, it was not, not the thing. Yeah. 
And then suddenly this guy from Singapore turns up, right? And they had no idea what even Singapore was, you know? Yeah. And I turn up and then I bring my music, which has got Indian, Chinese influence and all the things I grew up with, and they were fascinated by it. So I was all of Asia just in one person and opened the doors to Asia so, so, through so my music. For people to know about Asian yeah. music and people in the Asia. So I became like an Asian ambassador in yeah. Japan. for. I was there for seven years. I lived there. Wow, so with eight albums, and I know you actually wrote um, a song, Fried Rice Paradise. Yes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, where do you get all of this inspiration from? I mean, I, I think we are mm. also fortunate that we live in a place where um, there's a lot of colours, uh, different ethnic groups together. What were your inspirations and how do you get your inspirations from? You know, music? this colour, this ethnic group that you're talking about, um, we took it for granted, you know, we, and we always have, like, we've always been a multiracial country. Yes. Uh, my parents' generation, it was just, it was just part of it. We were part of Malaya. Everybody spoke Malay. You know, I mean, it was all, it was all mixed up. But we didn't think about it. Yeah, that's what. It was natural. Yeah, it was just part of us. But yeah. we didn't know how to identify it. And in 1965, we became independent. But at that time, and I was just a child, there was no sense of being Singaporean. It, it wasn't even important. Um, and this was a thing that I questioned when I was started to write songs when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. I started to think about, I'm a Singaporean, so why is my music like just Western? No, what, what is the Singaporeanness, the Singaporean thing of, about me? How because, old were you back then when you, oh, when I was, you thought of I started oh, about 14, what? yeah, 14, 15. And, um, and I, I only speak English and mm -hmm. Malay because I'm Peranakan. I don't speak Chinese at all because, you know, we... we I, Malay was my second language at school because in those days you could choose. Ah. And being Pranakan, I chose Malay, right? Mm -hmm. And then at home, we're very westernized. My, my grandmother was very colonial. The queen picture on the wall and all mm -hmm. that. So um, I had a real um, confusion about my identity. Mm -hmm. And last of all, I'm Singaporean, but that had no meaning in 1970, yeah. 1970s, people didn't understand what that meant. It wasn't even important, like, why, why bother? Why yeah. do we need to think about being Singaporean? So I tried to put it in my music, and I wrote Fried Rice Paradise because it's I wanted to do a together. song that was Singaporean. Oh. And I thought, okay, what can I do? I can try and write a Singaporean song, and I thought maybe food is one element that I could include and Singlish was an element I put in the in song. The song. I wrote the song in 1974. So that was my first attempt to make a Singapore song. And uh, the thing that happened was that when the song came out mm -hmm. on my first album, my first album came out when I was in 1974, the, 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 the song got banned by the government. Oh. It was banned from being played because it had Singlish. So, can you imagine, I hear I, I am trying to make a song that identifies myself. As a Singaporean. And I use Singlish because that's what we speak. Yeah. And the government banned, banned it, it. Because it's wrong English. English, it's bad English. So, my takeaway was, oh, it's not good to be Singaporean. It, I'm ashamed oh. to speak Singlish. It's not a good thing. We must push that aside. Oh, no. So that's what I carried with me for many, many years mm -hmm, mm -hmm. until I wrote home. So I think, ironically, home identifies mm -hmm. Singaporeans, right? Every, Singaporeans identify with the song home. That's right. And um, it's like a full circle for me. Mm -hmm. It took some many years. But, so you to know, come back to... Yeah, but it took a long time for me to get to the point where I could write a Singaporean song without putting Singlish in it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I know, and it's quite a journey. The whole circle. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing with us your experience in the music um, industry from the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. You know, in the past, right, it's easier, uh, in a sense, for us to promote music via like CDs, VCDs, DVDs. We had what magazines. Are <laughs> what, are they? what is all that? All right, <laughs> uh, uh, newspapers. Yeah. But now, okay, mm -hmm. the, the in thing right now is to promote music through TikTok social media, you know, uh, what are your takes on um, broadcasting music currently? 
How, do you, really think, it's, do you it's, think it's okay for, for us? Would you encourage youths to promote music in a concept where it's for free? I think they have no choice, right? I mean, in my time, it was all done for me, right? The record company did all the promotion mm -hmm. and they came up with the ideas how to promote. Now, you have to do it yourself. yourself. Yeah. But then, on the other hand, you can also release your uh, songs by yourself. Oh, that's true. You right? can create your own music. So, of course, if you're signed to a label, you get a bigger budget, you're, you, know, you get people to help and all that. But um, the difference now is that any, everyone and anyone can be an artist. And if you want to be an artist, you've got to do all of that. Um, so take me for, for instance, mm -hmm. I used to always be signed to labels, mm -hmm. but right now I don't have any label, I don't, I don't sign to anyone because I'm not producing a lot of music. But um, I do like to come up with something once in a while, and when I do, it's independent. Yeah. I have to put it up by myself. So I, have, I become like an indie. You yeah. know? I have to do whatever a young artist is doing now. So. I have to think about TikTok and I have yeah, to Instagram exactly. and all that. And Are you on a, these apps? I am on all of them, but really, really poor in, uh, <laughs> in posting. <laughs> and, you know, I do the easy posting. Now, okay, when Instagram started, remember? Oh, yeah. you take your food, you take your what? You yeah, take photos. Now you have to do a video. The very least is that do a reel. A reel. And so that means editing. You're putting yeah, even photos as well. I mean, you have to like do it aesthetically yeah. pleasing. And put music. You, you do them I mean? all by yourself? Yeah, right now. I'm, I'm looking for help <laughs> there because <laughs> I have a plan. I'm going to be releasing um, four singles, four songs oh, be, nice. from now to next year, August. Next August, by the way, is um, I'm celebrating the 50th anniversary of my career. Oh, wow. It's already the yeah, 50th My first album, 1974. So, 50 years of making music. Yeah. So, to do that, right, I can't just make a show. I have to sort of build up towards I have to think of you know what kind of promotion I have to do and this is something that I think that every artist now mm. needs to do, to do. Uh, there's one thing that was uh, that made a big difference in 2004 and that was Singapore Idol when that <laughs> turned up yep suddenly there was a platform for for young artists to appear to, on TV yeah. and through the sure, course of yeah. the season for six months you get to see and follow the careers of the artists and people like Taufik have become yes, household names, stuff. you know. Yeah, so that was a great um, platform and I was so happy to be part of it because when I was a teenager, there, there were TV shows, music, local music shows in English. I know that in a cha a Channel 8, they, they still do have some yeah. variety shows, but in, um, in the 70s, 80s, there were English variety shows and that gave me a lot of opportunity to go on TV and that's one of the ways I got seen. Mm. But then after that, two thousand, you know, like then in the kind 90s, of, there was like absolutely nothing. Yeah, it kind nothing. of died down a little. And then 2000, I, it Singapore came up again. Idol, three seasons, I guess, of yeah. that. And then now nothing. So now you left your own devices, you know. Yeah, exactly. Because who's watching free-to-air TV anyway, right? Yes. So they don't really have the budget or they, they think that it, you know, there's no audience and all of that. So I think it's really, really tough for, for young artists. And you can put your song on Spotify and if you go and see what's local, mm -hmm. there's a lot, and I would say there's a lot of crap. Like, sorry, uh, young musicians. You're not ready, don't put out yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, patience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, patience. get some expertise, uh, get help like, or be better. Yes. But there's so filter much... Filter it, filter it. Yeah. The fact that then there's so much out there and then not all of it is good. People stop listening like, oh, yeah, yes. you go through it all and yes. it's all And then people good. will start thinking that oh, Singaporean can't make good music. Yeah, but this is not only for Singapore. Mm. Every country, because yes. Spot Spotify makes it so easy for you to post. Yeah. So you need to have a USP, you know, unique selling point. Yeah. Uh, something really special about you. Um, I think people are not thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And, they're also and we not, should think about that. They're not also not thinking about a Singapore element? I think that is very important. It's yeah. a very important point. I think Singaporeans that, are not using the Singaporean element. And it, you know, then it, you have nothing unique about being... Why? You're, why? you're just yeah. following um, people, I mean, Western writers music all, yeah, from other countries. And. So in Chinese, it's different, you see, because yeah. you've got the language. 
So it doesn't matter where you're from, like JJ Lin is from here, but he's the biggest male Mandarin, Mandarin pop star at the moment. So mm -hmm. it's, um, that's universal. But English, Singaporean English. Where in are you? <laughs> yeah. And if you do something in English, you're competing with all English recordings in the world. So there you go. You have it's to, a lot of challenge. You have to stand out, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of challenge. Um, seems like there is no bar set on what's good and what's not because yeah. everything is so available online. But the, the key point over here is to be patient and, mm -hmm. and think of what the Singapore element is about. And grow. Yeah, and you grow must grow. It. You must grow and you must, you must learn. You must read. You must travel. Hey, that's right. Um, experience and exposure yeah. will help you in inspiration as exactly. well. Exactly. If you only know your world, <laughs> What, what art can you make? That's true. What well, that also brings me to the next question over here. I think Singaporeans are also cooped up in their, their discomfort zone. We are always like being very comfortable, especially during pandemic. I think um, maybe it's a little bit tougher to create music. I don't know. Why? That's the best time. That's it's when not I all at home like don't know what to but do. But that's I wrote so many songs during the pandemic because I was stuck at home with my piano. You know? oh, wow. So I rediscovered I like playing piano again and I started writing songs. I haven't written songs for years. Oh, so you disconnected with piano for some time? And before? songwriting. The whole of two, from 2000 onwards, when I came back, I stopped, basically stopped writing songs. Oh, wow. I only write songs when the government asks me to write a song. <laughs> But we all my have best, journey la, up and down. My best client is the Singapore, Singapore government. Singapore government. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> See, I, I think everyone has like um, their journey ups and downs and yeah. that includes you as well. And I think yes. not a lot of people know about that. So, um, you know, I just want to touch on this point about, um, you know, during the pandemic, we were, as artists, we were actually called the non-essential, mm -hmm. right? So we furthermore has this impression in Singaporeans that Singapore artists, Singapore musicians, uh, they're basically like non-existence, not, not important at all. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice for the young generation who wishes to step into the creative industry but are hearing all these things about like, oh, Singapore, mm, maybe not? I don't know. Are people really feeling that? Because that was a, a very unfortunate use of that term. But I'm sure they didn't mean it. I, I don't think it yeah, was yeah, meant... Yeah that you're not important, they just... You have to use that term uh, Not essential to the, the recovery of, of this disease maybe or something like that. But um, I think, uh, of course, um, artists are very sensitive, <laughs> I, yes. I would guess. Yes, very uh, sensitive. I, when I first saw it, I just laughed. I thought, oh, how, how funny, how ridiculous. But I mean, I guess, yeah, everybody felt... Um, felt a, a, a sort of attacked, especially when everyone was suffering. Oh, that's true. You know, it's not a good thing. But the thing is that that whole thing is over and I don't think people th still think that way, do they, you think? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm going to share some of my experience with you. Yeah. So I actually came from a theatre background. So um, in school, when I was in theatre school, uh, I graduated, I filmed a movie and then I was invited back to, to school for an interview. Then after the interview, during COVID, um, after COVID, after COVID, um, close to after COVID, post okay. COVID, then I had juniors coming up to me and asking me about how I am doing in the industry. But there's not, there's never like always like you know incline inclination. There's always like a up and down. And I told them my experience is nothing great. It's just really doing what you can do at the moment. Mm -hmm. And they asked me a question: Do you think? getting um, a certificate in theatre school is important. Do you think that whatever that we're doing right now is important? So mm. apart from just the question that they were asking me, the certification, whether is it important or not, right? I think the vibe that they gave me was they were dejected. They I were? A lot of, yeah, a lot of young um, artists are quite dejected. Especially if they graduated? Um, yeah. Mm. Or people who actually create music of their own, when they actually share it on their own um, social handles, they get a lot of attacks or side eyes, like, uh, like this person is trying to seek attention, but actually this person is really just trying to create music. You know, I think, it, okay, the one thing that everybody must do is follow your heart, right? If you have the passion, it'll show and you just do it. Some people just don't have the passion or they just have an idea of what they, they want, want but they don't really have the drive, the dedication. 
And so that, that's on their head. But the thing is that if you're good, you're good. You don't need any qualification, mm -hmm. right? I only have O levels. But I like to write music. Did, should I have gone to study music? Or, yeah, but I don't think it would have made a difference. I can learn by myself, you know, because the, if you want to be a good artist, just draw, right? If you want to be a good songwriter, just write songs. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go and study. So the good thing is that we have got all these institutions where you can go and, and expose study yourself, and expose yourself. But all these the bad thing about. is that every year, like thousands of, of, of students are being spewed out into Inside. the market, Filtered which cannot to... absorb them. Yes. We don't even have a strong enough uh, entertainment. We don't ha hardly have an entertainment industry. Um, you know, musicians are coming out and playing gigs in bars and basically yeah. that's what it's going to be for the rest of their lives. So it's mm -hmm. not a bad thing, but it's like if you're hoping for something more, I think you have to try a lot, lot harder. Maybe leave, go do it outside, leave you know. Singapore and try. Yeah, Expose like theatre. I mean, I, 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 I'm in theatre. Mm -hmm. I write musicals, right? How many can I do? Forbidden City and then LKY. It was like, Forbidden City was in 2003. <laughs> you know what I mean? And LKY came out in 2005 or something and just last year. Just last year as well. Nothing in between. It's not like I can do one every year. Because it costs, now it costs millions of dollars yes. to make a show. Exactly. And I can only hire maybe 30 people. So mm -hmm. not, not like everybody, you know. So it's, it's, it's like there's not enough opportunity. Yeah. But I do see small theatre companies starting. Yeah. To me, it's great that they're doing it, okay? But it's similar to everybody putting songs on Spotify. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit similar. So there are a lot of these small independent things going on, and that's good, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, world-class acts, even world-class indie acts are coming in. And you get to see it for almost the same price ticket. Yeah. So there's always this thing, you have to match up. You have to match up. I mean, it took many years for for me to make a musical that costs the same as Frozen. Oh, yeah. You know, for a ticket price. So people will, are willing to come to my shows because we have to give them that world-class staging. Mm -hmm. And it takes, it's a journey. I mean, it takes time. It takes, it took my whole life. So you, you have, do you have Patience. that Patience. Yeah. You have to just really dedicate yourself to it and sometimes even when you think you're ready to produce something and then you have to hold back a little bit to to consider again look mm. at it again i think the more you look at it um, the better you know how to correct it so. yes and i would like to say one thing as advice to young practitioners of theater or especially musicals okay mm -hmm. i want to say something because i've i've seen some musical local musicals and everything and i think what people have forgotten about making a musical is that it's a musical. It needs music. The music is the most important thing of, of the production. And a lot of um, young people who are creating musicals, they are not really strong in music. Mm -hmm. They're great. They, 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 they can produce. They've got story. they got whatever. But the music always lets, lets them down. So I think you need to really get study musical music mm -hmm. of musical mm -hmm. theatre. Mm -hmm. Polish on, on that. Yeah, part study of it. more, write more, you know. They just write the songs almost like fillers, you know. Ah, uh, yeah, so, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. so I, th I think that's something that uh, please um, brush up on your mus music, comp polish composition on ability. We should always, <laughs> um, you know, learn. Continuous learning is very important. Yeah, no don't just write one musical and, and stage it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and always like copy and paste. Like, oh, yeah. I can do this, I can do the same to the other. Always like learn. And now you can say we got to start somewhere. So I think that's good. So maybe, you know, start. Yeah, I guess I can't argue that you got to start somewhere. So you got to do it. So just, just do it. But um, don't be refine too, um, it. Yeah. Refine it. If you're gonna do anything, refine it. Do workshops. Refine mm. and be. Patient. Don't just write it and put it out. You know. We are always so impatient and just want to like push Except it out. Patient. Thinking, like, oh, patient. I, I did this thing. Yeah. You know, don't go for instant gratification. Correct. Right, okay. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us this afternoon. Pleasure. I'm really, really honoured to be here to listen to all of these interesting stories. Thank you so much for being with us on the Voices of Nation podcast. My name is Belle. And I'm Dick Lee. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Singapore! Singapore!